Shalom. Today we are going to discuss the names of the four sons of Aaron. We first see them in Exodus 6, 23. And Aaron took him Elisheva, daughter of Aminadav, sister of Nachshon, to wife. And she bare him Nadav, and Avihu, Elazar, and Itamar. The first of these sons is Nadav, which comes from a verb root that means to be willing, generous, or to urge or incite. He appears to be a bit named after his grandfather, Aminadav, which means my people are generous. We see this in Exodus 25 too. Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. With his heart he shall take my offering. And as you remember, the people brought so much stuff that Moses told them that they could stop bringing things. The second son is Abihu, which is made up of two words, Avi, my father, and Hu. So we can say it means, he is my father. The third son, Elazar, is made up of two names, El, which is God, and Azar, which help, means help. There are many other Eleazars, which is the same name, in the Bible, including Moses' own son, Exodus 18.4. And the name of the other was Eleazar. For the God of my father, he said, was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So we have two first cousins, Elazar and Eleazar. The fourth son is Itamar. E is a word meaning an inhabitable land, generally a maritime area or even an island. And Tamar is the date palm tree. Tamar is a name that appears frequently also by itself. Now, as, as we look at them together, they, they don't appear to add up to much. But if we set them into this Pardes framework, we might learn a lot. So as you remember, the Pardes is an acronym for a method of study. The P comes from the Peshat, the Hebrew word, that means to be stripped of something. And so the P reminds us of the plain meaning of the word or the verse. The R, Remez, is something that's really an inference. We use R reference to refer to something else. The Dalid, the does, the Drash, it's a devotional where we dig into the meaning to see how does it apply to ourselves. And the S sound, Sud, is the secret, the secret meaning. When we talk about the Peshat, we usually apply the meaning to the forefathers. And as we saw, that the forefathers were generous people who did things willingly. Exodus 25, 2, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly, with his heart ye shall take my offering. Not only these people in the, in the wilderness who brought things for the tabernacle, but if we think about Abraham, Abraham willingly let Lot choose where he wanted to go when they were going to divide up. He willingly took his son Isaac up to the mountain. He was generous in feeding the angels that came to have lunch with him, and many other things that the forefathers did willingly. When we talk about the remez, the hint, we're talking about things that pertain to Messiah. And Avihu, the son of Aaron, he is the only person with that name. And remember, his name means, he is my father. The things that Yeshua said about himself, John 8, 54, Yeshua answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But it is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yeshua was very sure that Yahweh Yehovah was his father. In John 10, 36, Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now, Nadav and Avihu were always together, and they did some things with father, their father Aaron, but we cannot talk about them without mentioning the strange fire. Numbers 26, 61, and Nadav, Nadav and Avihu died when they offered strange fire before Yehovah. As far as the forefathers are concerned, we see over and over again that, in fact, they died. As it says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that we have all sinned. And also Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Messiah Yeshua our Lord. So in terms of the forefathers, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all men died. 
In John 6, 49, it is written, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Acts 7, 15, So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers. Hebrews 9, 27, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. But adding hope to this eventual fatality, it is written in Psalm 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of Yahweh is the death of his saints. Now concerning Yeshua, not that he died for his sin, but if we look into this, his death was prophesied, and he spoke of it many times himself. Isaiah 53, 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. So I want to take a minute to talk about this word strained. In the most basic meaning, it means to be a foreign or of an alien nation. And the people were expressly forbidden from doing things, from worshiping the way that the pagan nations worshipped God. On the other hand, there is an implication of things just being odd or peculiar. For example, in Isaiah 28:21, For Yahweh shall rise up in Mount Perazim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Givon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. So Yahweh himself has done things which do not match up, let's say, with his character or things that we expect. The Hebrew word is czar, or in the next verse we see that it's muzar. It's something strange. It's something alien. In Psalm 69, which is a messianic psalm, verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien to my mother's children. We can see that Yeshua's brothers and sisters were questioning him about the things that he, would, that he was doing and how he conducted himself. Not that anything he did was against Torah. It was not. Everything he did was consonant with Torah, but they considered it strange or odd. They didn't recognize what he was doing. We can consider this from two different points of view. There's a divine point of view in which Yeshua was ordained to do what he did, and he did what he did out of obedience. And there's a human point of view as humanity looks upon the rest of the world and perceives that there is such a thing as human sacrifice. What Yeshua did was not human sacrifice. I want to be very clear about that. But as people in that part of the world lived, they knew that the aliens, the foreign people, did do human sacrifice. However, it is written in Hebrews 9.12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What he did was strange. It was unusual. It was not a pagan sacrifice, but it was different than what the people had been experiencing, which was the blood of goats and calves. In verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So this is strange. This is something we would say, Muzar. And again in 1 Peter 3.18, For Messiah also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The whole idea, the concept is strange. It's not sinful. It was ordained, but it is strange. When we come to the drosh, where we search and look for the personal application, we find Eleazar, God is our help. Numbers 3.32 And Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, shall be chief over the chief of the Levites, and have oversight of them that keep charge of the sanctuary. And due to the death of Nadav and Avihu, he becomes the chief over the priest. He's taking Aaron's place. He's not the firstborn, he's the third, but he does inherit the position. Numbers 20.28 and Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount, and Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. Now initially, the Levites were not to have been the priests at all, but the firstborn were to have been the priests. In Exodus 3.12, Sanctify unto me 
all the firstborn, whosoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And again in Exodus 19.6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. However, there was that mess with the golden calf, and after that, the Levites became the priests. When Moses saw the riotous play going on in the camp, he said to his tribe's people, the Levites, go through the camp and slay those people. And so in Exodus 32, 28, we see that the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. And so God gives them the place of the firstborn in Numbers 8, 16. For they, the Levites, are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel. Instead of such as open every womb, even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel, have I taken them unto me. So they replace the firstborn as priests. However, with the coming of Yeshua, First Peter tells us in 2.9, But ye, meaning all the believers, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in the devotional framework of Eleazar, who becomes the high priest, we are to follow him, and God is our help. Now it's interesting, because how can they be a royal priesthood? In Exodus 6.23, we saw that Aaron married into the family of Nachshon. And who is Nachshon? In Numbers 1.7, it says that he is of Judah. This is the same Nachshon, the son of Aminadab. We know there are two separate tribes. The Levites are the priesthood. Judah is the royal, the king line. But Aaron married into that line, and so his sons have both tribes of blood running through them. And we see that this same Nachshon is in the line of Messiah in Matthew 1. Aram begot Aminadav. Aminadav begot Nachshon. This is the same guy we're talking about. Nachshon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz of Rachav. Remember, Rahab. Boaz begat Obed from Ruth, his wife. Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Now, who, who is our help since the coming of, the, of Yeshua? He said he would send the Holy Spirit. In Greek, this is Parakleta. And the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost, which is Shavuot, as it is written in John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now this word is variously translated as helper, and comforter, advocate, and intercessor, and counselor. It comes from the verb parakalein, which means to call to one's aid. And so truly God is our help. As it says in Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Finally, we have the sod level, which we interpret as the future time. Remember that the sun, the fourth sun, is Itamar. Interestingly, when the people came out of Egypt, they came to Elim, where there were 12 walls of water and three score and ten, that adds up to 70, palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Interesting, 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. That could be its own presentation. So here are palm trees in Israel, and there are thousands of them as you drive by on the road, grove after grove. It's a very productive crop there. Palm trees are often compared to human beings. They have these things in common. There are male and female trees, and they require fertilization in order to produce fruit. They stand upright. They live for a long time, about 100 years. According to Iranian sources, the palm tree originally came from an island. So that's interesting that his name is E. Tamar, the, this idea of the maritime region. The seeds are very hardy. In the 1960s, they found a date palm seed in Masada. So they know it's about 2,000 years old. And they planted it, and it grew a tree. And they've named that tree Meth Methuselah. The nice thing about the tree is that if it's heavy weather and the wind, it bends, but it does not break. And the palm is universally considered to be a symbol of victory. 
in the Middle East. So we read Psalm 92, 12 through 14. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of Yahweh shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Now, palm trees are associated with the holiday of Sukkot, specifically the holiday of tabernacles. We read in Leviticus 23, 40. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. Now, whether they take these uh, boughs of the trees to build their sukkah, to build their tabernacle, or whether they were to use them in the way that current Orthodox tradition has it, holding the branches and the lulav and the etrog, the fruit with it, and shaking it. This is not clear. However, it is part of the celebration. The palm trees are part of the celebration. And what is Sukkot? Sukkot represents the final age when their uh, Messiah has victory. We see in John 12, in what is called the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, here comes Yeshua. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now this was not Sukkot, this was coming to Passover, but because they received him as the king, because many people felt there was going to be a victory, that is why they have the palm trees. Also in Maccabees, we see... The people have the victory over the Assyrians, and here they are with their palm branches. In 1 Maccabees 13.51, On the 23rd day of the second month, in the 171st year, the Jews entered it, that is the temple in Jerusalem, with praise and palm branches, and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. Finally, in Revelation chapter 7, after the bowls have been poured out and there there is the victory of the 144,000 who have been marked for God, then it is written, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. I'm sure we're all waiting for that time, for the time of the victory of Messiah over the world. Until then, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom. 